the May meeting of the uh, Finance, Efficiency, Economy, and Sustainability Subcommittee. We'll uh, start this month's meeting like we start all of our meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. Councilman Waring, will you lead us in the pledge? I will. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple packets of minutes. Uh, we have the April 14th, uh, 2015 uh, minutes that have been provided to all the subcommittee members. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the April 14th minutes. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, those pass unanimously. We also have April 15th. Uh, minutes uh, from that meeting as well. Do we have a motion on that? Move approved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes unanimously. And that brings us to item number four, authorization to enter into contract with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our Economic Development Director, Chris Mackey, is here with a uh, guest from GPEC. Just a reminder, the city of Phoenix along with Maricopa County are the two largest individual members of GPEC, and so we have a significant uh, impact on the GPEC uh, budget and, and program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christine. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and Council members. We're here today to talk about the annual renewal for the GPEC contract. Of course, GPEC is the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, and they're our regional marketing partner for job creation and capital investment in the community. I have the Thank you. Just as a, a, a kind of an overview of what we've seen in the past with GPAC, our return on investment through our annual contract with them since inception in 1989 has been 35 to 1, meaning for every dollar we invest, we recoup $35 in, uh, in capital investment and job creation and economic impact. While, G, while Phoenix is 12% of GPAC's total budget, we're 40% of the locates that uh, GPAC has brought into the community. We've been very fortunate that our partner has been able to hold its per capita rate flat for the past decade. So we've not seen an increase based on a, a revenue increase from them where we see a slight increase um, each year, of course, is in our population creation. We're at 43.7 cents per capita, and that's been that way forever. So each time we add a new citizen, we add a new 43.7 cents into our contract with them. Um, we have board seats. I know our city manager is actively involved with GPEC, our mayor is, and then we have our private sector board seats that sit to help really influence and guide uh, GPEC's mission and GPEC's uh, uh, agenda based on what's in Phoenix's best interest. And GPEC's also very supportive of the trade in Mexico that we see. And if I could introduce, I, I, I should have done this at the beginning. This is my colleague, Angela Talbot. She's a vice president with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council and one of our great partners in recruiting companies. Thank you, Christine. Okay. That's helpful. Okay, thank you for Welcome. having me today. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. Um, so from a regional perspective, you know, certainly we have 22 cities, towns, and the county of Maricopa that contribute to the marketing and business attraction efforts of GPEC. So over five years, we've worked with companies that have brought in over $1.2 billion of payroll into the entire region with over 27,000 jobs, um, many of which are high wage, and uh, worked with about a thousand companies over the last five years to show them the benefits of the region, why they would bring their capital investment, their job creation, and their uh, corporate citizenry to the region. So we're very happy with the results that we have and certainly looking to always improve and always increase the number of prospects that we receive and the quality of prospects that we re successfully recruit into the region. Me to go over this, yes. the, uh, the return. So oh, uh, actually, I will. I'll be okay. happy to go over this. So as we look at, uh, at GPEX locates over the last five years, 40% have gone to the city of Phoenix. We've had, a, as we talked about, a 26-year relationship. We've been a member since its founding in uh, 1989. We've seen over those years, in the last five years, 63 locates have landed in Phoenix, 7,800 jobs, and more than a billion dollars in capital investment. 364 million in new payroll. 
Um, again, $35 of direct revenue for every single dollar invested. This is just a list of our locates. Uh, they're in your packet, so I won't uh, go through these details. But I think what is so critically important as we look is that in the last um, two fiscal years, and not counting through this full fiscal year, is we've seen 3,500 jobs created with an average salary of almost $50,000. So I think those are significant jobs uh, doing great for us. And we have a couple of new ones that we'll be adding on to here. And I apologize, if it's not in your packet, I'll make sure the copy's left for you immediately. So we have a number of goals, um, certainly as an organization and then moving forward. Um, but as far as our business attraction goal, our we work very diligently and hard to connect site selection consultants, corporate real estate executives, um, and other decision makers to the region, to public leaders as well as private leaders, to help the people who are already here make the sell on the Phoenix region. So we work very closely with um, communities, certainly to host executors where we bring in these consultants that Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies hire to go out and evaluate the region and make different regions and make a decision as to where that company is going to deploy capital and create jobs. And we want to make sure that those consultants who are advising companies understand what the region has to offer. So we spend a lot of time building relationships with those groups and bringing them into the region so they can actually fly into Sky Harbor, get on light rail, come downtown and explore the area and see, feel and experience what we have to offer. So we'll continue working on that as well as sales missions domestically and internationally. We just returned from Hanover, um, Ger Germany, which was home of the largest trade show with about 6,500 exhibitors, most of which were manufacturers, but also um, a lot of advanced manufacturing, robotics, R&D, and that sort of thing. And we had a great opportunity to talk to numerous companies there about the benefits of being in the Phoenix region. Do you want, yeah, I can go in, sorry. Mm -hmm go into a couple of other the other items that we have outside of business attraction. Um, it's really important to us that the communities and the region is very knowledgeable about different industry segments that are growing and um, that we have potential to grow within. So we did a lot of analysis about the aerospace and defense industry when prior to sequestration becoming such a well-known word, uh, we were on top of it and looking into the analysis of what we have to risk and how we mitigate that risk in losing companies. Uh, we what have that we can sell companies on? How can we help those companies grow and experience that um, tremendous amount of capital investment growth and job growth that we expect will occur? So a lot of deep analysis that goes into um, helping the communities understand what the opportunities are, as well as making connections with the companies that are here representing those industries. Um, our next is uh, working with advanced electronics as well as cybersecurity and analyzing what sort of opportunities we have given the assets with Arizona State, um, some of the military um, investments here as well, and working in conjunction with the City of Phoenix cybersecurity programs. And Council members, I think one of the things that's keyly important here to mention is not only do we work closely with GPEC on locating companies, but it's on strategic research. It's on significant amounts of research, and their research team is second to none in the information that they're able to provide us to ensure that we remain competitive. So I talked a little bit about business development. We certainly, that's our bread and butter. We know that's why people want us to exist, and that's what we've been very successful in doing, um, growing the economy through business attraction and development. Um, we will continue our efforts on that. Um, as I mentioned, certainly FDI activities into Canada, which is a major partner of ours, and we see so much success coming from, but also uh, Western Europe, where we're seeing a lot of activity as well. So we'll continue honing in on the opportunities in those markets, hosting international and national road shows that uh, allow mayors and public officials to go into those markets and meet 
companies and consultants and decision makers that are there in that market and be able to kind of talk about the important parts of Phoenix and why a company would be interested in coming in. Um, we're also working very closely with the cities on what we're calling the Corporate 100 program, which is essentially looking at the largest employers within the region um, that are not headquartered here because uh, the economic development, um, business expansion and retention groups are very, very good at creating and maintaining local connections, but what we seem to kind of um, miss a little bit is that connection at the corporate headquarter level, the decision maker level. So our goal is to work in conjunction with the city of Phoenix and other cities to go out to the headquarter location and make sure that the decision makers there really understand why they should grow their presence here in the region. And as an example of that, it is, what played out in the headlines, of course, was the acquisition of PetSmart one of Phoenix's corporate headquarters. As soon as we knew, and we knew, of course, before the press hit what was going on, GPAC and Phoenix had put together an analysis. We had already reached out to the company, and we were working directly with the corporate headquarters to ensure that those executives stayed here in this market and that any new CEOs or president or key leadership would be relocating to the Phoenix market, not relocating the headquarters to where those CEOs were. And we were very successful in ensuring that that happened and that headquarters stayed here in Phoenix. Yeah. And so then on the competitiveness side, certainly that plays into our ability to attract and retain companies. So uh, as Christine mentioned, a heavy dose of our um, infrastructure is within our research department. So our research department looks at um, those market intelligence programs that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're also looking at developing a competitiveness think tank that basically takes um, private officials and as well as public officials to come in and unite together and talk about what are other regions doing? How can we be better with tax policy and the way uh, city processes work and the way our interaction with companies works and really constantly comparing ourselves and benchmarking ourselves against our competitor markets to ensure that we remain successful. So the competitiveness think tank um, will be a really robust group of very intelligent, smart people who want the economy to grow. We're also looking at high impact districts where we are identifying what high density areas contribute to um, potential for not just companies to move in, but also what are those other offshoots um, that we can really bring in um, secondary economic development uh, marketing to the areas that have a high concentration of maybe it's manufacturing, maybe it's advanced manufacturing, maybe it's R&D, um, and looking at the companies that are there as well as the support services. So maybe that's a marketing group that works for you know a sensor company that is located in an area surrounded by other sensor development companies. So trying to identify um, what those hotspots are and then market them beyond from a regional or state perspective. So I think, again, we've been very fortunate that our um, great partner has been able to hold their per capita rate flat. They've held it again flat this year. So we are asking this committee, uh, staff is recommending for this committee to authorize SHPEC's contract to move forward for the same amount as we did last year, um, and holding that flat and allowing us to continue to partner with GPEC on these great jobs and these great companies coming here to Phoenix. And with that, we'll be happy to take any questions. All right, well, thank you for that presentation. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Okay. Vice Mayor? Yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you for coming out. I always enjoy listening to, to GPEC and listening to the, to the um, uh, just for the updates. I think everyone needs to understand who our, our stakeholders are and who our partners are, because I really do believe that this is a, a strong partnership led by Chris Camacho. Mm -hmm. And, um, and and everyone there at GPEC. Uh, Chris, I appreciate your comments on just highlighting the, the research that GPEC does. I was there recently, and literally everything you need to know about the city, about the valley, about the state, uh, they have it. And, and uh, they have a plan for it. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's great that, that you're working closely with them. They speak highly of you, by the way. And as you know that, uh, I, I want to thank Chris Camacho uh, and uh, on because of his his effort and the focus that you have around entrepreneurship as well. I was recently in a, uh, at an entrepreneurial conference uh, last week, and uh, much of the information that I took with, along with our information from 
you know, our, our uh, department's CED, I'm sorry, our city CED department uh, came from GPAC. And uh, we might even have an announcement to be made soon about bringing one of these entrepreneurial conferences mm -hmm. to Phoenix because of that type of research. So uh, this is, and I said this before, as it comes to GPAC, there's, there's a difference between a cost and an investment. This is absolutely an investment that we cannot uh, move away from. And so we have to figure out how, we, how more we can work with GPAC and make a greater investment as far as I'm concerned. I am certainly supportive of, of this item. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Nowkowski. Well, it's great to hear that. We, we only make up 12% of the um, budget and we have 40% of the um, projects. But one of the things that I think we need to improve on, and it's even us as the city of Phoenix and GPEC is just marketing Phoenix. I know that we have this great campaign now, Phoenix is hot. But I mean, when we travel around the country, I mean, you see other cities that are being advertised, even within our own city, you have other cities that are being advertised, especially California and Texas. Um, we need to really um, do a better job at that. And I think that working together with our staff and, and the resources that you all have, we can really do a marketing campaign that we can bring out using the um, 100 corporate head, um, heads of those corporate organizations and bringing them out here for spring training. I mean, think about it. I mean, we have spring training. We got great weather. We have golf courses. I mean, we should be whining and dining these corporate um, companies and, and just bringing them and let them, let them have a taste of, of Phoenix, of Arizona. Um, I think we just really need to be a little bit more aggressive. I know the city is starting to do that, and I really like to see the whole state and e even GPEC take a, a bigger role in that. I mean, the role that you all played at the Mexico City office is incredible, and I'd like to thank you for that partnership. I know that when we travel to Mexico City and we go to um, Hermosillo and Guadalajara, I mean, GPEC plays a major role in talking to those businesses and trying to attract them to the city, to the city of Phoenix and to Arizona. But I think we can do a little bit more um, working together with our economic um, department and also with our sister cities program. How can we utilize programs that we already have existing and just capitalize on that? I mean, a lot of times they can open up doors through our city um, sister cities program to meet with some of those elected officials that have contacts with those business people that can actually draw those. So how I think I like to see y'all work with what we have already and kind of not work on an island, but how can we bring all these different great organizations and programs and, and departments that we already have. And I can only imagine at the state level and at other city levels, and we can really form a, a kick butt team that to really market our city and our state and bring some of those major corporations here. Chairman Councilman Nokowski, you make great points. We'll, I've made some notes here. We'll work with GPAC and come back to you with what our strategy is. It's funny you should say that about sister cities. Right as I was coming down here, I was visiting with Paula West and saying that we needed to introduce her to Stefan at GPAC and start cross-relating that. So you are, are absolutely spot on, and we'll report back to you about how we progress with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, Thanks for the presentation, uh, and I especially appreciate the focus on corporate headquarters. Again, that's something that's so important, and we absolutely want to try and attract new ones, but thank you very much for the focus on PetSmart. I mean, that could have been a real, uh, there's a real risk that, uh, that that corporate headquarters could have moved away. So thank you for uh, your great work there, and thank you as well, uh, GPEC, for uh, keeping the contribution uh, the same this year. Uh, we uh, seem to spend a lot of time over here talking about budgets, so thank you for not increasing the burden uh, on the city of Phoenix. So with that, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion. I will, uh, I will make a motion, but first I forgot to mention an important young man, Joseph Roselle, mm -hmm. who is with GPEC, who is a rising star, who is helping to lead this entrepreneurial ecosystem, really, um, out of GPEC. Uh, we were fortunate to have him. He was actually an intern with the CED department here before we stole him, and he was uh, the District 5 intern. And, uh, you know, great things ahead for Joseph, and GPEC's lucky to have him. So We're trying to steal him back for you. Yeah, we, we really <laughs> should. Uh, you know, I'm, he's just a rising star and, and really one of the reasons 
uh, we're becoming the, the mecca for entrepreneurship right here in Phoenix. Uh, I move approval for approval. I'll second it. Okay, we have motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is item five. This is uh, amending chapter 43 of the City of Phoenix Procurement Code. Mr. Young, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for having us here today. We're going to talk a little bit about chapter 43 of the Procurement Code and a recommendation uh, to this subcommittee to recommend to council to increase the competitive formal threshold from $35,000 to $50,000. Okay. Uh, as you know, we implemented our procurement code in January of this year. And one of the things that occurred is that we moved the procurement, formal procurement threshold from $50,000 to $35,000. That had an unintended consequence. And back in March of 2012, the council had approved the local small business enterprise program where local small businesses uh, could participate to a greater extent in procurements below $50,000. By moving the formal threshold to $35,000, we really diminish uh, their ability to participate in those programs. So by moving it back to $50,000, that would be very consistent with the council authorized uh, policy from March of 2012. A few things to note about our proposal. First, the current payment ordinance is at $8,600. So any payment in excess of $8,600 has to be on a contract or would appear at council. Uh, and we see that every week. Uh, that would not change. That would continue to be the case. However, one of the things that we have changed with e-procurement is that we have moved the council authority component ahead uh, of where it is now for purchases below $35,000. So in today, today's world, a purchase above $8,600 but below $35,000 would uh, appear at council most likely after the good or service had been received. Our intent uh, and what we're doing today is making that authorization, council authorization, occur prior to the award of a contract or expenditure of funds. So in this particular case, the $8,600 threshold would not change. And in fact, $8,600 to $50,000 would appear before council prior to a department entering into a, an agreement, unless it was an emergency or something like that. Uh, and then, of course, everything over $50,000 would be through the formal process. So council would still be able to touch and see and review the vast majority of all payments that we make uh, and, in fact, would be doing so in advance. So by moving the threshold from $35,000 to $50,000, we have the opportunity for greater participation by our local small business enterprises. And at the same time, Council does not give up any authority and, in fact, will be able to see a number of contracts in advance that you would not otherwise see today. And that concludes our presentation, and we're looking for council action on this. Thank you. Council Nowakowski. Can you give me an example seeing something in advance? What would that be? Let's say, for example, uh, the water department needed a pump or something that was not covered by an existing contract. It was, it's in excess of 35 or in excess of $8,600. Uh, as we move forward and it's less than $50,000, we would be going to council seeking permission to procure that pump in advance of actually getting it. So that way uh, the department and our procurement shop knows that there is council authority to acquire that pump. Now, an emergency would <coughs> yeah. an emergency would be if that pump breaks and it's something that stops water service within the city of Phoenix, then the city manager would give you approval to, to purchase it. Mr. Chairman, Councilman Nowakowski, absolutely. There is absolutely no way that we would stop operations or put anybody in danger as a result of this change in the threshold. Mayor, uh, 
uh, Chairman Gates and Councilman. So I think today on the procurement ordinance, we see some of that. What we're trying to do is to make more that way. So sometimes you see very specific dollar amounts with cents to them. Those generally are approvals after the fact. Uh, you're going to see a bunch here towards the end of the year, which are big round numbers, and those are getting approvals before the fact. So just one that sticks in my head is we're going to have on the next week's payment ordinance uh, an item to pay the Central Arizona project for raw water deliveries to the water department. That's a before the fact authorization for next year's payment. We're trying to do more of that so that you, to, to get to the issue that's been raised about you're asked to sign off on things after they're done. What choice do you really have? We can't do that across the board because sometimes the water department has to buy a pump early, but we're trying to do more and more of that where you're authorizing the dollar amounts before as opposed to after. Councilman Waring. So, so currently that water pump, we would find out about it, as you suggested, in our packets after it was already bought, yeah. purchased. Um, and now it's going to be the reverse of that. You're coming to us, which which I hardly approve of. We're trying to. We're, we are working to have departments plan ahead more carefully on these smaller purchases, so that you're seeing it beforehand, not after. Yeah, and yeah, you know, it's just. I know we got a big budget, billion two, and all that, but but fifty grand isn't a small purchase either, to my mind. What I can't remember, and you may have told me, what was so special about the number eighty six hundred? I mean, why not ten thousand or five thousand or? How did we come up with that? I don't remember. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilman Waring, there is a provision in the city charter that requires... 8,600. <laughs> actually, 8,600 has been modified up to 8,600 one time. So the council has the authority every four years on the payment ordinance threshold dollar amount to inflate it by an inflation factor. Uh, that hasn't been done in quite some time. I think uh, currently, if we so were It's been 8,600 has been the magic number. For some period of time. I mean, when push comes to job, really, because that's what voters have suggested. Correct. For for a long time, it sounds like. Correct. That long was enough that you don't remember when the last time was that it got changed. It's just an odd number. I, yeah, I, I said I never is. thought to ask and why. So any, any change would need to be done through a charter amendment. Right, which is a big, <laughs> for those watching at home, Kind of a big production, it is. so so we wouldn't do that willy nilly. Um, it would cost more than the eighty six hundred. Yes, so one way to look at it. Um, well, it's definitely a healthy change, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, I think we're all probably given the tenor of our last couple, both policy and formal. Yeah, I think timely. the last couple of meeting, it's very timely. Uh, I'll never look at the word retroactive the same way again, given how much it's been used in the last couple of meetings. But I appreciate the change. I think it's it's a good one. Thank you, Councilman. Any other questions or comments? I just want to thank you, Chairman, for pushing this um, agenda item and something that's really needed. And, you know, it makes us as council members sometimes the bad guys because we end up getting some complaints from um, residents saying, why are you all spending that much money? And then we really don't know what's going on. Then we have to delay a project or, 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 or a purchase. And it makes us look like the bad guys. So this, this way it's going to actually bring it to us prior and then we can actually ask those questions before you purchase those things. So thank you so much, Chairman, for, for bringing this to you. Yeah, no, thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. I agree. And that has been a real point of frustration to say, well, I, I, you know, I don't agree with this particular item. Well, we've, the work has been done. So it's really hard in good conscience to vote to not pay for some work that's been done already, even though Maybe if we, it would have come to us first, we would have not supported doing whatever that particular item was. So, and I know we've we've uh, you know taken a couple shots at this, but but it appears to me that you guys have gotten it right, and this is going to be a real positive change moving forward. So, with that, I would uh, entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion. All opposed, no. Motion passes unanimously. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you very much. Item six is the customer information system upgrade project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a large undertaking by the city over several years as a partnership between water services and public works, particularly the solid waste side, Ginger Spencer, and the information technology department. I think you had asked for some more information on this. It will be an item coming to the formal agenda, 
And so I'll turn it over to our Chief Information Officer, or Water Services Director, to uh, give you the information. Sure. Good morning, uh, subcommittee. Thank you for having us. So um, we'll just give you a broad overview of our customer information system, and then uh, Ginger and I will do that and talk about the business case for the upgrade. And then Debbie will talk with you in particular about the contract that's before you. So um, you can imagine we have a very large water, wastewater, and um, solid waste system. We do have software to manage our customer information system. Um, that software has uh, not been updated in quite some time. And one of the things that I have heard regular complaints about from both the public and from the council is um, the lack of uh, self-service options that we currently have today. So in particular, it is um, not particularly easy to pay your bill online. Um, and we do not have the ability to, um, for people to use their mobile devices. And that's something, obviously, that we need to fix. That's one of the main reasons for the upgrade of our customer information system, is to improve our customer self-service options. Uh, the other, actually, and, and I'm sure Debbie can talk about this in more detail, because I'm not the expert in this area, but um, we do want to ensure that we have a very reliable and efficient server uh, platform for this infrastructure. We bill about $750 million a year. Um, through the customer information system. So it's really important and key to our uh, revenue and to our financial viability that it's very reliable. So um, we also, just so you know, the customer information system obviously handles the city services bill. Uh, it also, though, is the interface for customer requests. So if a customer wants um, their water turned off, their water turned back on, if they, if they need some barrels, whatever the customer might need, say a high bill audit, that also interfaces with our customer information system. So it's a very complicated system. Want to make sure that it's running smoothly for our customer. So I don't know, Ginger, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the business needs from solid waste. Yes, so um, in addition to what Catherine just stated, um, this is very critical to our daily operations for solid waste. Um, everything flows through our customer contact center using the customer information system. So um, of the numbers that you see up there, um, 390,000 of those customers are actually solid waste customers. And as far as customer requests with the barrel delivery and repair, we get about 300 requests each day. I saw a report this morning, um, just for today's work, 386 requests. And so that's for new containers, uh, replacement containers. So we, we are very busy in this effort. Well, and yes. so. Yes. You know, I, I get I get calls from constituents about that. Yes. I mean, my barrel's a little gimpy on the wheels, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I've had it for <laughs> however long I've had the house, they're just three years. Um, I just, is there a more durable barrel? Because that's a lot of barrels. I mean, you get that rain or shine, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, you're getting that kind of complaint. I mean, that's... Yes. Um, these are durable barrels, the most that are out there in the industry. What's happening, it's because of the sun, is the wear and tear. But we do have a warranty as a part of our contract because of the, um, having to replace them more frequently in Phoenix because of the damage from the sun. How much do we spend on the new barrels every year? Um, <clears throat> as, as we look for efficiencies, it just seems like... Yeah, no, no, but yeah. Yes. I mean, that's just, that's just a lot of money I mean, with that volume. Yes, let me find out. I know that we recently... I mean, um, factoring out the warranties. And, yes. I mean, what are we actually writing checks for right. for this? And is there, a, is there a better way? How long have we been doing this this way? Yes. I mean, I appreciate the work on the customer. I know I'm taking mm -hmm. this a little bit away, but it's yes. still a potential <laughs> savings. Yes. I hadn't realized we were replacing. I knew I was getting calls fairly frequently mm -hmm. from you know friends all around the city. They just know me, and they're like, my barrel broke. Yes. But um, but I have been surprised at how much it comes up. I don't know if you guys have had a similar experience. Yeah. Um, so it's not just getting them a the new barrel, but if there's a if there's a way to do that, I know it's probably a niche market of people making garbage barrels, but. Yes. <laughs> so there are new uh, requests as well as um, replacements. And I know we just came forward last week to council with the request for that contract. Um, so I'll try to get those numbers to you. Yeah, and I didn't, I, at the time I didn't realize the number of yes. broken barrels every single <laughs> but day. But I, I will say of our um, 390,000 customers, it's about, it's less than 1% of what we're looking at. So. But I will say it, sh it seems like that should be a durable, not to yes. beat it to death. But it seems like that's a product that you're, you know is going to be used. Right. You're always going to need it. Yeah. It's not like the phones or something where there's going to be a new phone in a couple of years, so you don't expect right. it to last forever. You yes. definitely expect them to be using a garbage barrel your whole life. So, 
And if the public's Last listening, maybe one. someone will uh, come up with a new, <laughs> more durable container oh, and, uh, and bring it forward sorry as to part, take us far part of our field, call of innovators. But, but look yes, at, yeah. okay. For this particular it. committee, it's aptly yep. named. So. Absolutely. <laughs> so with this upgrade, it's really going to help us, as um, Catherine said, with more self-automation uh, for our customers. So it's going to enhance and increase customer service. Um, and it's definitely going to allow for more efficiencies as well. So like I said, with that 386 requests just from this morning, those were individual requests that have to be um, a we look at them on an individual basis. With this upgrade, we'll be able to group them by service area and that sort of thing. Um, the total budget for this project is close to $18 million. It is a very large project. It's a pretty major undertaking. Um, and just so that you have some background information on this as well, one of the things that we're very careful about doing this time around is making sure that we are reevaluating our business processes so that instead of configuring software to allow us to continue to do things the way we currently do them, which may or may not be the most efficient way to do them, we are looking at how we can make sure that our business processes meet the software so that we are using the software most efficiently um, so that we're not creating all sorts of new configurations that then become problems for us down the road. It is a very large project. Um, I'll have Debbie talk a little bit about her request as part of this $18 million. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk a little bit more about this very important project. I think I'd really like to start with the big green box, uh, talking about current operations. Right now, Catherine and Ginger, we do have an existing system, and we do have existing staff that take care of the daily care and feeding of this technical environment. However, when you are beginning and you're working on a new project, um, you really need to move your current staff from the current operations so that they can begin to work on the upgrade, which is the reason for the box on the left, the light green box, where it says backfill IT technical position. So what we're going to do is we're going to have technical uh, contractors come in, and they're going to maintain our current system because this project won't be done for a couple of years. We need people to just do the routine care and feeding. That will then allow us to move our existing staff into the dark box, which is the upgrade project box. I guess I shouldn't be doing that on the screen. The viewers can't see me. <laughs> but into the upgrade project box. The other thing that we will need is that because the new system is going to bring a lot of new features, the front end system in terms of the, I'm sorry, the web access that Catherine talked about, the self-service, the mobile, these are new technology features that we do not have today with this customer care and billing system. Therefore, we need to, once again, hire some contractors from the right-hand side that possess the new current skills for the new system. They will also join the project team. Our staff will then be able to work with them side by side, learn the new features, functions, and capabilities so that when the project is online, both of those uh, contract staff will go away and we will be able to support the environment. And so just to follow up on that, like yes. once this is done, uh, I will be able to request a, an e-bill to be sent to my Bank of America, you know, where I do my banking. Uh, that That is something we'll be able to do. Uh, Council member, yes, that is correct. So, but I want to clarify, it is possible to do e-billing today. Okay. Um, Customers need to go in every month and um, go through our existing web portal and pay their bills. But it is also possible to do an ACH payment, um, which basically allows us to automatically deduct the water bill from directly from your banking account. Okay. Both of those are possible. Yeah. Um, what we're looking for it are some enhancements, for example, so that people can sign up and have recurring payments so they don't have to keep coming back every month if they want to do it mm -hmm. through the web interface. So some of those things are possible today. We're looking for enhancements for the future. So, but, it, but an, but an e-bill, it's actually a bill that like, you know, credit cards, right. you can do that now in your, your online banking um, portal? So council member, you can only do an ACH, which is a direct draw. Right, so you, right. but you can't do an e-bill. Will you be able to under this system? Yes. Okay, great. That, that was my understanding, I want to make sure. Because yes, I understand, like for example, I don't get a paper bill anymore. I have to be, I get an email right. 
from the city of Phoenix water department. But what I want to do, I don't want to get that, e have to get the email and then go in and type right. it in. I want to get a, a, an e-bill into my, my banking, my online banking portal where I can just click it and pay it that way. Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, um, that really explains the need for this technical staff augmentation. Once again, first, we need someone to help us maintain our existing operations so that we can continue to care for the system while we're upgrading it. Second, this new system has new features, functions, and capabilities that we do not currently have. Our staff also does not have the technical skills. So we will learn those skills, and then once the system is brought on board, the backfill IT staff will go away, and the contract technical professionals will also go away. So that is the reason for our request. And I'm sorry, I just wanted to mention one last thing on the budget. So you'll see up here that a fair amount of the um, infrastructure and professional services contracts have already gone through council for approval. The server infrastructure um, has been approved and is in place. It's implemented. It's up and running, yes. Yes. And uh, we brought forward just, uh, I believe it was last month, the professional services contract. Um, the current award is to Ernst & Young. Um, so the, what's left really is the, techno, the technology backfill that uh, Debbie described. So. so this is probably an unfair question, but what is, as we've talked about the length of time that we've used our phones, for example, and things like that, what do you anticipate the life uh, span of this particular system will be? Uh, council member, so I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Um, I, software. Yeah, yeah that, okay. that's. I, I can answer that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, it really depends upon how long you choose to use a system of this nature. I believe in Catherine's budget, they plan for a seven year life cycle for this one. But I think our future upgrades will be less painful mm -hmm. because, once again, Catherine and her leadership role is using the system as it is out of the box. And when you use a system out of the box, you can upgrade it much easier rather than customizing it. Mm -hmm. So that will be very helpful to us. But I, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a seven year life cycle for this particular system. Doesn't mean she will have to, but that's what, that's what the budget is, is accounting for. Thank you. Um, questions or comments from my colleagues? Can I ask just, so in, in terms of these, the years we'll be using this, how antiquated is the system we're using now? What year would we put it in right. if? Council member, um, it, it's actually, it's not that antiquated. That's really not the problem with our current system. It was implemented in uh, 2010, I believe. So it's actually not that antiquated. The problem is it that doesn't necessarily mean it was cutting edge in 2010. Correct. But at least it was. Correct. And, and the software package that we're using is an Oracle-based product. It's called CCMB. It is commonly used throughout the utility industry. Um, it's not that antiquated. The problem is that when we implemented it in 2010, we configured it. We, we didn't look at our business processes. Customized we customized it. Thank you. That's the better word. Uh, we didn't look at our business processes. We didn't review them. We just came in and said, all right, you technical experts, come in and just make it look, exact, look and feel exactly like how we do things today. And so we had all these customizations built into it. So for us today, it's a very inefficient um, product because we did that. So we're, we're, uh, our customer service agents, for example, are having to click through far more screens than they, would, than they should need to, for example, to do an account adjustment or something relatively simple. So really, we see a lot of the benefit of this, mainly in customer self-service. That's the main driver of this. But also, we see that our work will become far more efficient. And that should mm -hmm. help reduce call wait times. Because while people are on the phone um, waiting, you know, our customer service agents are in there trying to adjust someone's bill or take care of their problem. That's taking too long. So we, that's really um, one of the main drivers for the upgrade. I, mean, I guess just using the example I know best, which is myself. So I've been on automatic withdrawal mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. which seems to go fine. I assume that's the ideal situation. But I understand people might be nervous. I might not have the money and so forth, which is really what we're talking about, right? The individual, they want to do an individual transaction. Correct not just have it automatically withdrawn. Right. What I did remember about the experience was, so we moved, and I had automatic withdrawal at my old house, and I wanted automatic withdrawal at my new house, and then I had to turn off the water eventually, because there was some overlap at the old house, and make sure it was on, of course, when we started up at the new house. And I think I had to actually come in to do that. Does that sound right? 
I, I think, isn't there an office <clears throat> basically just right kitty corner here? On the yeah, other side of council, me council member, that, that's probably correct. So, um, and I want to be careful. I don't know exactly what the new system is going to enable us to do for that type of situation. So, you're still going to have to come in. Because obviously, for me, I work here, so for, I could just walk across the street and stand in line. I don't remember there being a huge line, frankly. I think probably a little bit. And then, uh, you know, it's a pretty smooth transaction, but it wouldn't be smooth. If I worked at Desert Ridge, right. I had to drive down. So, council member, our goal is to help people so that they don't have to come in, right. so that this is much easier. The more we can cut down that for the environment and parking Absolutely. and all those factors, it's good. Though I will say, um, but you're not guaranteeing that you we, won't have to come down. I can't guarantee that. that. And the other issue is that we also have to balance that with protection of customers' identity. Right. So there are cases where we um, we have to ensure. So that I guess the fear would be someone somebody is stealing they they somebody's. Which doesn't seem like it would go on. No, I'm not saying it's not a problem. It just doesn't seem like it would go on notice very long because I'm already an existing customer. Right. You vetted me. You're getting right. paid. It's automatically withdrawn. So even if I didn't want to pay, it's still getting paid unless I turned off the spigot. So and bankers have told me that's pretty much like giving someone access to your account. They actually don't like you doing that. But I've had enough experiences with that that I can see why. Um, but. But so there might not be any way around that and make that experience simpler for people because people move all the time. Right. So council member, so uh, what I can promise is that we will try to make that as smooth and efficient as possible and minimize the inconvenience to the customer. Limited but to one trip or something. Right. And and maybe there's some things that can be done electronically um, in terms of leases and, and other things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I, I just don't know yet exactly what those improvements will be. So I want to be careful not to promise. Yes, Council Nowakowski. I just want, want to thank you for using technology to its fullest. I mean, the 329,000 walk-ins can really benefit by using their their phone or just going online at home and not, not coming down to downtown Phoenix or to one of our office sites. And the um, 760,000 call-ins, wow. Yeah. That's a lot of call-ins every year, and, and those are contacts, right? So I think that through information and letting people have access, it's really gonna help us cut down those numbers of calls and those numbers of walk-ins and really give that best customer service out there. So really wanna thank you for looking at the best ways of doing it and I'm in favor of it and whenever you want a motion, I'm ready to make one. Okay, any other comments from my colleagues? You're good, yep. Uh, well, I would entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, I just wanted to thank you for making the presentation. This is a large spend, so I just want to make sure that everyone was aware of that. I think it makes sense, though. Uh, when you talk about customer self-service, I mean, I hear efficiency and I hear lots of savings as it relates to um, you know, personnel, quite frankly. And in addition, I think that um, there's going to be shorter wait times, so it's going to be worth it. But again, I just want to make sure that uh, everybody in, on this uh, subcommittee understood the cost that was involved. But when you're talking about $850 million in revenues coming in every year, I mean, it's you, you can justify it, and, and there can certainly be efficiency savings. So with that, unless there are any other comments, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That takes us to item seven, which is the excess city-owned property update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, our monthly report. Last time you asked for more specific information as a subcommittee on our economic development projects that are issued through a request for proposals. And also, I know there's been a lot of discussion in the past. Uh, Councilman Olkowski has, has been working on this with what the status of parks uh, properties um, and when what those might do. I think what we'll do in the interest of, I, and I know um, Vice Mayor Valenzuela has a potential conflict on the Camelback Ranch property. So the first thing is we do th is we will uh, present on everything excluding Camelback Ranch uh, property. And then we will, after a motion on that, we will go back and specifically focus if there are any questions or issues on that one particular property, which is in the parks uh, item. And, and that will allow the uh, vice mayor to uh, declare his potential conflict. So we'll start first with everything except the one specific parcel in, in the parks uh, area. And our chief financial officer will lead this off. Thank you, Ed. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, we're also here with Mary Vivian Withrow, deputy director who helps manage this program on a day-to-day -day basis. 
of course, Chris Mackey with Community and Economic Development and Jim Burr. Just a real brief status of where we are today. We continue to actively uh, pursue uh, offers and market these properties through our contractor, Jones Lang LaSalle. Uh, we can see in 2013-14, we were able to sell uh, a property for $1.6 million. Uh, so far in uh, fiscal year 15, we've sold nine. Um, we still have uh, 12 other properties out there accepting offers, and we continue to work those as well. And in fact, uh, 12 new parcels were approved by council in March, uh, and Jones Lang LaSalle will be initiating marketing activities as those appraisals uh, are completed. With that, uh, I think we'll turn it over to Chris so she can talk about the RFPs. Thanks, Neil. Again, good morning, council members. Uh, the first one we'll talk about today are economic development properties. Uh, this one will be actually before uh, DAR this afternoon. It's one of our container projects that we're recommending this subcommittee move forward to council, 9,000 uh, square feet, and it would be uh, container housing. So we'll be seeking council approval on this project shortly. Very exciting to us. Our West Fillmore property, uh, which of course this council has been actively involved in and they approved to move forward to the RFP process on March 26th. As you'll recall, we acquired these properties over a number of years and the final properties were acquired with partnership from the Phoenix IDA over the last two years to uh, complete the assemblage of 7.4 acres. Uh, we are working closely with Downtown Phoenix Inc. As you'll recall, we went out for a, an analysis and kind of a community planning session to see how this property should develop. This RFP is open. It opened on April 30th and it closes on June 30th. Yesterday was our pre-proposal conference and we had more than 70 participants uh, in person and then we had hosted a webinar as well. So we had a significant number on the webinar. We can't tell you how many were on the webinar. So very excited about who would be coming forward with that. We'll be back before this council in the October, November timeframe with our recommendations through a fully vetted public process and through a public committee that we'll be working towards. Two new RFPs that we'll be bringing before this committee in the very near future would be Second and McKinley. Uh, McKinley is approximately 28,000 square feet. Uh, are excited about what that could potentially hold and then working with our transit department now on some remnant parcel that they have remaining west of the northwest or west of the southwest corner of Camelback and Central. It's about 0.63 acres that's immediately adjacent to another property in the area. So uh, we'll be taking that out for coming back to this council for a recommendation and taking it out for an RFP in the near future. So a number of other parcels that we'll be seeing coming forward to you are our 19th and Montebello which is our park and ride on light rail that is our termination point now. We won't need it in the near in the future, 19th and Camelback, and several other significant properties that we'll be back for before this council. So a piece of property is that? Sorry, sure. On 19th and Montebello? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that one, but I'll get that to you. Yeah, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. The council gave us direction to look at these properties in 2013. Last fall, we came to the subcommittee and talked to you about all the park parcels we own. It's over 41,000 acres and identified the ones we thought could be considered at your direction. We went back then and worked with the Parks and Recreation Board this spring. Did a number of meetings with them, including an hour long work study session where we really delved into each and every parcel and looked at when we acquired them, how we acquired them, why, where they are related to other land use plans, other neighborhood plans regional trails, schools, et cetera, and came up with a recommendation um, identified, and that's what's in your report today, is we have 12 undeveloped park sites throughout the city that we're recommending the subcommittee to recommend to the full council we consider for sale. The Parks and Recreation Board did, in that motion, ask that you consider their policy for public outreach and involvement so that we would follow that policy and uh, do contacts with the neighborhoods, do meetings with the Village Planning Committee and meetings with the Parks Board after you all approved the 12 before we actually sell them. And we're here today to talk about those and uh, with your recommendation, go to the full council. And we provided a map in your packet of where they are. They're uh, all over the city, but primarily they're in that uh, last big growth area, which is the Levine Australia villages. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions from my colleagues? Council Nowakowski. 
can you explain the process? Because I think that's where the hiccups happen. And which, why, the, which process? The sir? process of um, obtaining um, undeveloped parkland. <clears throat> if I was a developer and I wanted to purchase parkland, what are the the steps I needed. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Nikowski, the Parks Record Board's, Recreation Board's policy is that we do an extensive outreach that starts with um, this identification. So if the council recommends that, that would be the first step. And then we do direct mailings. We identify the parcels, um, all the residential properties within, a, I believe it's a quarter mile, do a direct mailing to them, invite them to a meeting, a public meeting, talk about that. Then schedule a meeting with the village planning committee so we can have the local community talk about it, not just the immediate neighbors, but the village, and then come to a another meeting with the Parks and Recreation Board, and then a final decision meeting, and then bring it to the subcommittee and this council. So it's probably, the 11th step process is probably several months in the making to get all those meetings scheduled and take all that input. But their idea was to make sure that the communities adjacent to these knew about it and had a chance to chime in and, and comment on that. Is there a reason why it's different? Or what was the purpose of having a different process than what we normally have for other departments? Um, I believe it's just because when we acquired parkland with the various um, sources of money, it falls under the Parks and Recreation Board and the Charter to advise the Council on the use of those lands, and this is one of their policy steps. Um, we had had a sale of a parcel a few years ago where we thought we did enough community outreach. We did the normal steps, uh, came to a subcommittee, went to the full Council, we did sell the parcel. But after that, the greater community got pretty exercised about it and raised a lot of questions about why we did that, why we didn't notify people. So we created this process, and it's more elaborate than others because I think of that experience. Okay. May, uh, Chairman, Councilman, I think one of the issues is that oftentimes people make locational decisions based on the potential of park proximity. And so I think the, the reasoning was so that there are not surprises to people who've invested in perhaps thinking, oh, there's going to be a park a half mile or a quarter mile or even a mile away from me. That we, we try to get as much word out so that's not a surprise. So at the very end of the process, the council doesn't end up with 50 or 100 people saying, we never knew that you were going to do this. So particularly because parks often impacted in that way, this process, I think, was put in place. Councilman? And what is the process for other department properties? Do we notify the community at all or the council district office? Or is there a notice that goes out to the community? Uh, Chairman and Councilman Nowakowski, Yes. The, the short answer is yes, and I'll, I'll go through the specifics, which is once a property is identified by a department, first of all, we do an internal notification to all city departments to ensure that no other city department needs the property. And then um, with your guidance, we have refined our process to ensure that we notify the council offices in the respective districts where the property lies to say we have a recommendation to propose disposal of this property. Do you have any concerns? Whether or not there is community involvement typically depends upon the method of disposal. So we confer with Jones Lang LaSalle once we have um, concurred that, that no city need exists, and we determine what the recommended marketing strategy is. If it is an RFP process, then obviously there is more outreach and more community involvement. If it is purely a straight, straight up sale, we're going to market this for the highest return to the city, then no, there is not community outreach other than Jones Lang LaSalle doing extensive marketing and the advertising that the city typically does. Councilman Wary? So on the on the notification, so we, we talked about this before, Jim. So uh, I'll just use the example that's in my district, the 24th Street in Happy Valley. It looks like that picture that I assume the viewers at home are seeing on the screen right now, we're seeing right in front of us. It's just, are they all like that, just flat pieces of land? Uh, yes, there's no hint that something good was going to go there. Uh, let me put it a different way. None of these are scheduled to be built next year, and now we're pulling the rung up from under community, which I think is kind of to Ed's point, and now we're not doing it. This, these were all like very rudimentary. They were on the master plan at one point, but now probably not going to do them for a long period of time, if ever. Councilman, I think that's correct. They're all vacant lands. There might be one or two of them that are really still just raw desert, had never had any improvement. They're all fenced, they're all posted as future park sites, and they're all sitting in that condition. And, and part of the direction of this committee is if we weren't going to be doing something in the foreseeable future, five or ten years, to develop them and operate them, to consider them. So that's what we took under advisement. So 
I know the one, so the 24th Street one in, in my district, that's pretty much kitty corner to a, uh, uh, an actual houses, right? Houses are there and then it's sort of at an angle. I mean, that's about as close as you can get. What about the rest of these? Are there houses right next door to them or? They're all in slightly different situations. For instance, the one down in District 6 and 17th in Liberty Lane is next to apartments. The one at Camelback Ranch is, in, sorry. Um, the one at 99th and in Cano is right in the neighborhood uh, and several of the ones in the Levine Village are in neighborhoods. We did start this process last year and looked at two of them on this list and did some community outreach and started the mailing process and started engaging people in it. So uh, at least in those two cases, it's not completely unknown that something might be considered. And people will have plenty of time to push back against this, bring it to our attention. If, right? if you and follow so, the, I mean, it was gonna be the recommended process, process is what ending sometime kind of at the end of this year, as I remember it. Is I that, believe it'll take several months to yeah. do all those steps. So I think that'd be a, a good estimate. Fair estimate. Um, we talked about the one again at 24th Street the zoning. So what, so somebody buys it, obviously they're not going to want to just leave it. They're going to want to do something with it. Um, you know, in that case, it would be houses like the houses right across the street. Is that kind of a similar, is that similar to what you find with these other locations? I don't, I don't have the, excuse me, I don't have the zoning on my cheat sheet. Sorry, but yes, I believe most of them have existing zoning because they went through some kind of land planning exercise at the time we acquired them and it would be consistent. If it's not, then that would be a step we would take to either look at um, evaluating, uh, is that gonna change the market? Is that gonna change the sale price? Is that gonna change the acceptability? But we're not approaching this as a land developer to maximize dollars. We're trying to do this in your direction to look at. Well, and that's my concern. I mean, so like the 24th Street Keeping it one, consistent with the neighborhood. That was gonna be houses just like yours. I think that's, not a park. I understand that. That's the if general it's gonna be the intent. Sears Tower, then definitely that's gonna get noticed because <laughs> that's a little different than. Should look like the community they're in. So, and you're gonna, you're going to reference that at the public meeting. Yes. So, so they're going to, okay. Because I, I just think that's a point to emphasize. Um, you know, people might find different uses objectionable. They may be like, well, if it was houses, that's fine. If it's a Circle K, now I'm mad. Just want to make sure that that's what, what's possible with the zoning because they're not going to know all the jargon and so forth. Part of the thinking of taking it to the village planning committees is because the community is used to that, having those conversations there and looking at those kinds of land use impacts. And we can have that discussion and everybody can see that. And then if, if developers or someone's interested in developing and proposing on one, they can tell us whether or not they would be putting in uh, HOA type open space that would give some kind of uh, space to the community back. So. Just, there might be people mad about this process and so forth. Obviously we gotta keep the city fiscally solvent, but surprising people and then making them mad is not acceptable. So okay. it sounds like we're, we've got that covered. Just wanna make sure and give some thoughts about how that might go, my perspective. Thank you, Councilor Nowakowski. Uh, I experienced trying to um entertain some developers that wanted to uh, purchase some parkland and it really became chaotic uh, what i like to do is um, instead of putting our realtors and future land purchasers in that scenario because i think what happened was it it all became this new ordinance um, came about because of that little canyon park that it was an existing park and we took some of the park away and the community got angry these parks properties aren't parks at all. They're actually sometimes blighted areas. Um, there's nothing on those, as, as you can see in the Not picture. Not currently parks today, that's right. So what I like to see is maybe instead of going into this process, that maybe the parks department goes out to the community and sees if they're even open to the idea. Because I, I understand that a lot of um, these areas are in District 7. I know that there's some communities that are all for it, and there's other communities that aren't for it. And I think we need to educate people that there's the funding for these parks are probably 10 to 20 years and um, down the road. And if they would like to see something else instead of a park or instead of an empty field with some tumbleweeds and stuff in, for the next 10 years, that there's this option before even bidding it out or having our realtors go out there and creating chaos within our own districts. So maybe if there's some type of um, community outreach and seeing if there is a need or if the community is even open in recommending these 12 sites, if there's a hiccup on two or three of those sites, maybe forward the eight or 10 or whatever it is to us. Councilman Waring. Can I, uh, I forget the particulars, but, but Cashman Park in my district in Desert Ridge. So, so that already was a park 
and then they wanted the HOA wanted it to be a nicer park, and the HOA put up quite a bit of money yes. to make it a park. I don't know how much it costs. I don't know how big these properties are, and so forth. Is there going to be an option if if a community wanted to develop it as a park themselves, or if there's a way that hey, they're fronting two thirds of the money or something? We always wanted to have a park there. Is there going to be any option? Uh, of that nature, and I forget exactly what the financial arrangement was with Cashman, but but they put up five hundred grand or something, right? They put five hundred grand to improve an already existing park, to improve the landscaping, right. et cetera. So as we go out and do the I community, guess one more is how much more would it be to like do a whole park or something like that? Is that even feasible? As we go out and have these community conversations, as you just suggested, Councilman, and we get that feedback. Uh, I think it'd be incumbent on me to bring it back and okay. have a conversation with the council and see, as as are you interested in this, the deal right? One, I don't know. Yes, I think we'd be very open okay. to that. The big challenge is the capital cost for development, then the little challenge, but the forever challenge is the operational cost. So we'd have to look at both sides of that equation. Just to clarify, GM, to Councilman Nowakowski's question, my understanding is if you look at the staff report, uh, I'm looking at page 31, what, what this action from the council would be would be to start steps one through five and then on page 31 step six says after all this prd staff park staff uh has gone through the process and then they come back to the parks board to recommend whether or not to sell the the land we're at the beginning of that right we haven't we haven't done any of that outreach on any of these we have not subjects. that's correct we're so, right at step one at yeah, the very so the councilman's point <laughs> Your authorization, this first one is for 11 of the 12, then we'll do the 12th one after. But your authorization would be to start exactly what you said. The park staff would then go out and start that conversation. If there are hiccups, they would come back to parks board and say, these three, four worked well, these two had these issues, and then the parks board would say what they want to do. So it, you're not saying right now, go and do these, go and sell these. You're saying start the process right. through this if that distinction helps. I think that's what you were asking about. Exactly, thank you for the clarification. And just, sorry, just one clarification on that too. Even if the Parks Board approves it, it still has to come forward to the full council. Mr. Chairman, yes it does. Okay. Vice Mayor. Well, some of those changes were made recently, correct? Speaking of- This policy? Uh, yeah, the, well, the Little Kenyon yes. Trail and, and uh, the park there, I remember, I walked into that. That 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 park transition took place before I took office, and there was discussion and making more changes to the park. And uh, there was a land swap, and uh, essentially, it became an issue where essentially this West Phoenix neighborhood lost the park to South Phoenix. That's how it was viewed, and so we pushed to make that more of a public, uh, more of a public process in the future. You, working with you, Jim, and thank you for working with us through that whole process. But uh, we haven't had many of those in the history of Phoenix, but now it's set up to where uh, we would have to put that out to the public. Nothing has taken place in that area since, by the way. That was the only trans, uh, transaction that, that took place. But um, you know, it's always, it's always a good idea to get it out to the community. And, uh, and it's, it's better. It's better than the end also. I mean, coming as someone who stepped into this office, and Claude did a very good job as a, as a council member, uh, none of the rules are broken, but just realizing that maybe there had to be some, we should be improving that public process, which we have. So thank you for doing that. Yes, this is a new policy, and we just started it, but stopped a couple years ago since that uh, transaction. So as we go through this, as the manager said, we'll do all the steps. We'll keep you informed along the way. We'll check back with the Parks Board, and then, of course, we'll come back to the subcommittee and the full council before anything happens, before Mary gets to, gets to sell it, <laughs> if it happens. Any other comments or questions? I would entertain a motion. Move to approve. So, Mr. Chair, just to, just to uh, clarify, the first recommendation from staff would be to recommend council, your, you recommend to the council approval to begin the process for sale of the 11, the first 11 in that chart that goes down, but it does not include Camelback Road and Ballpark Avenue in this motion. Uh, so that would be the, the first recommendation that we would make. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, motion and second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Now we will um, proceed to the uh, remaining item. Do we have a motion on uh, the Camelback Road and Ballpark Avenue property? Move to approve. I think, uh, 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 yeah, I'm just, potential yeah, conflict. declare a potential conflict. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Noting that um, the vice mayor has potential conflict on this item. Any discussion? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes three to zero, uh, noting that uh, Vice Mayor Valenzuela did not participate in the proceeding. All right, thank you very much. And that takes us to item eight. Item eight is the update on the city's entrepreneurship efforts. Ms. Mackey. It's economic development for sure. That is a, it's a good thing. We got a lot to talk to you about. Excuse me, I'm going to get the remote control down here. Well, I'll say good morning for one last time here this morning. Uh, here to give you an update on what we are doing in our entrepreneurship activities. As you'll recall, at your November meeting, we talked with you in detail about our strategy, and that strategy included outreach to local stakeholders expand our entrepreneurship ecosystem, identify assistance for entrepreneurs, and really focusing on our marketing and our brand and our promotion opportunities. We talked about by the end of fiscal year 16 uh, that we would have a thousand new makers, startups, entrepreneurs, and of course 5K in 5Y. Our action items were to really to expand and promote the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and we'll talk in detail about how we're doing that, retain our talent, identify funding assistance for our entrepreneurs, and come up with, uh, identify 50 placements of brand recognition and earned media that we could focus on. Also utilizing, uh, additionally utilizing our public library space for entrepreneurs and participate in five prospect trade shows or recruitment opportunities for entrepreneurs. As we look at our diversity in our entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Phoenix, it's getting even deeper. We currently have seven co-working spaces, two maker spaces, three incubators, three accelerators, and have a strong focus now on our angel investment. CED is paying tremendous attention on adding value to the entrepreneurship ecosystem. In our marketing, brand creation, and promotion, we are partnering at this time with ASU uh, on an entrepreneurship business plan to attract additional investment into, that mar into the market. And that money will be used for events, space planning, uh, marketing and business plans, and student internships to be able to assist our companies providing uh, attention to our students and giving them experience and providing a, a precious resource and asset to our entrepreneurship companies. We are, uh, as you know, that program was funded by our Industrial Development Authority, and we are presenting before the Industrial Development Authority with our final plan next week. We'll be bringing that full business plan uh, to each of you for your review and discussion. We created a marketing strategy to attract and help our early stage companies. That was part of our strategic action plan that we brought before this council back in September. And we're in the process right now of finalizing a brand strategy geared specifically towards the startup community. And I think that's important to note that we fully engage the startup community to talk to them about what their buy-in was, what they wanted to see. And I think as we're ready to bring that to this council in the next week or two, uh, you'll be very excited about what that looks like. So what are we doing? Really focusing on events and our outreach into the local ecosystem. We organized, we're on the organization committee for Phoenix Startup Week, which was a five day event that was held here recently. We hosted in Lace Tech Exchange, which was a three day event with our Mexico friends on the entrepreneurship side to talk about collaborative partnerships in that venue. We partnered with Verdi Exchange which was an international program. It was in its, its multiple years. And I can tell you from Verdi Exchange, we have seen significant activity that looks like some of it will become very real and landing here in Phoenix. We convened the maker community to talk about what they needed, where they see themselves in the space, what we can do to help them, and what we can do to really get them to collaborate and let each other know that they're there. Uh, recently, in partnering with the mayor staff, we hosted the Girls in Tech and DPI hosted our Girls in Tech. That was back on April 26th. Uh, very well attended, more than 400 people. They maxed out 
on their number of attendees that could be held at that conference, and that was at the Palomar. CED staff is regularly in attendance at the Hive on a weekly activity to help our entrepreneurship community. We work daily with our existing entrepreneurship community, with GPAC, the Arizona Commerce Authority, the Greater Phoenix, uh, excuse me, the uh, Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, and others to ensure we're really providing a thoughtful dialogue and help to the entrepreneurship eco space. We're working with one of our existing co-working partners on looking for expansion space. Uh, they have identified a couple of spaces that work well for them and we're hopeful for an announcement in the near future. We're working with Chicanas Por La Causa on their makerspace expansion in Arnold's Pickle Factory with Ideas Squared on assisting them in their expansion into uh, CPLC space. We've partnered with Public Works on their RFP and CFI for uh, location of tenants on their Technology Solutions Campus, which is to help us with the 40% diversion. Uh, I think you've heard, some of you have heard the report of the tremendous activity that we've seen from that RFP and the future CFI. Uh, two new entrepreneurship spaces have selected Phoenix, and they will be making announcements in June. And we're very excited. Of course, Council will be uh, fully participating in those announcements. Working very closely with the entrepreneurship staff at ASU on events and companies and programs, also with our friends at University of Arizona and with Maricopa Community Colleges. Uh, Maricopa Community College is a particularly interested in moving forward on their entrepreneurship movement. As we know, they have CEI, which is looking for its expansion space. Not only that, but they've got some new and exciting uh, endeavors that we're working closely with them on to see about bringing here into the downtown market. We assisted with Engagement Lab, who opened in the Arizona Center. We brought before this council at your last council meeting our CDBG open app where we were able to provide some funding sources to entrepreneur activity. We located Venture of VA Angels, which is a Canadian, a Canadian angel investment firm that's done more than 100 transactions into this market and now continue to work closely with them. And we're collaborating with CEI on a new maker video that we'll be able to post on our website. If you haven't seen our new website, we are seeing significant activity. We're up 22% over, uh, over the month of April in hits on our website and really working on beefing up our entrepreneurship activity and a lot more video and focus. Uh, the city is going to continue its strong support of entrepreneurship market by positioning itself as a fully engaged partner to these companies. You know, it, our, our large companies are wonderful. We love working with them. We work with them day in and day out. The excitement really comes from those entrepreneurial activities when you're looking at what are those next new job creations? What's that next new capital investment? What's that next, next new technology that's going to spin out of that market? When you look at academic development and where you see your strongest growth and your strongest activity, it's in creating those next new companies that are going to grow in your market and become the next Apples and Intels and Microsofts. Um, really focusing on those companies to diversify the employment base here in Phoenix to make sure that we are not as cyclical as we've been in the past. We're really excited in where we've come in just eight short months, and we'll be very excited to report back to you uh, at the end of your summer break in the new activities that we've seen over the summer and bring you up to speed on, on everything new that we're working on. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from my colleagues? Uh, sure, I, I guess I can first. Vice Mayor? Yeah, Chris Mackey. Ms. Mackey, we are so fortunate to have you uh, uh, leading economic development with the city of Phoenix. All of these ideas, Phoenix is hot, and you have an entire team that's working with you, but this is all Chris Mackey. This is you know, a, a person who understands that all of it is relative. The way you market our city, the things that we should be talking about, things we should, we should be going after, uh, especially when it comes to uh, entrepreneurship. Economic development is incredibly important for our city. Entre, uh, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is the very foundation of economic development. And when you think of entrepreneurs in our city, you know, we, we, have, we have to realize that we have such bright minds out there and we have to let them lead the way. Uh, our role is to support and it has served us well. In the last few years, uh, it's put us in a position to make these goals like 5K and 5Y or a thousand in the next year. And we're gonna reach those goals. Uh, and we're doing this, by the way, on the Lena's government in the last, you know, nearly four decades here with the city of Phoenix. 
So, uh, so it's all promising. How many major cities can say that they're that they have repurposed 2,500 square feet of library space to act as a free business incubator with a track record of enterprises being born out of this space? Uh, people getting the, the mentorship that they need, working closely with our co-working spaces, our incubators, accelerators, uh, higher education institutions such as ASU and Skysong, of course, what GCU is doing, uh, NAU and U of A. Um, it, it's, it's impressive and harnessing all of that in a way where everyone believes that we are all part of this ecosystem. You mentioned the VA Angels, which is the, the largest uh, angel investment group out of Canada who could have, they could have gone anywhere in the United States and they chose Phoenix. We were uh, at the press conference and to hear, uh, to hear that one of the reasons they chose Phoenix was this 5K, 5Y talk and uh, the fact that they wanted to be part of that. Uh, the uh, the co-working spaces that want to come to Phoenix, uh, I remember meeting with them very early on. Phoenix wasn't even a consideration. Uh, they could have chose anywhere, chosen anywhere to go, uh, but coming here and, and getting the information that they need from the city of Phoenix, but even more important or just as important, they're getting it from others who are part of the ecosystem who are not City of Phoenix employees. So it's, it's working really well. Uh, and, and now that we have these goals of 5K, 5Y, and many of these are going to be tech jobs, which create more jobs. Uh, and, and we have to, you know, I, I think we're doing a good job and you're doing a good job, Chris, of, uh, of, of continuing to focus on the angel investment in the angel investment area because we need funding Otherwise, these entrepreneurs are not going to find the funding in Phoenix. They're going to find it in Northern California or Austin or wherever, New York. We want them to stay here. Uh, working closely with our school districts, again, all of our uh, uh, education institutions, you know, we're, we're really on to something. Just yesterday, the mayor and I uh, discussed the TEALS program, uh, the tech, technology education and literacy in schools. Uh, Kevin Wang, who is with Microsoft, it's a great story. So Kevin Wang with Microsoft, uh, he's, he's passionate about getting this type of education, computer science into schools. You'd be surprised, very few schools, high schools teach computer science, but that is the wave of the future. If we wanna stay, keep up with what the workforce is going to be for all of these, uh, technology jobs. We have to get that type of education in our schools. So together we are starting that as well. So it's all relative. It's all working together. It's all very exciting. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be, we are honored to be uh, uh, just working with you in this space. Lastly, I'll just say that, uh, you know, the, the efforts of GPEC, who was just here earlier, and all of our chambers communicating, working together, you as the hub, the city of Phoenix as the hub, communicating with all of our partners, it's working. I was at, uh, in Northern California for an entrepreneurial uh, conference last in the last two weeks. It all runs like one long day, but in the last two weeks, uh, and Phoenix is on the map. Uh, there are a lot of people focused on what is going on in Phoenix, entrepreneurs from all over the country hearing about what's happening in Phoenix. And it's just a, it's a great feeling. So, uh, so the efforts are working. We're, I believe we're closer to the beginning than the end, which is really exciting. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm appreciative, so thank you. Chairman Vice Mayor, this council's direction and vision have really given staff the ability to move in the levels that we needed to. You gave us direction to create a brand and marketing campaign. You gave us the direction on 5K and 5Y. You gave us that direction and you've given us the resources to go out and make it happen. So we really appreciate all of your participation and your engagement where our economic development activities are concerned. I think you, I agree with you, we're at the beginning, closer to the beginning and not the end. And it is incredibly enjoyable for us now to be recognized. Phoenix is known now as a leader in the entrepreneurship and startup movement. It's not 
you know, Phoenix, well, that's hot. Now it's Phoenix is hot. That's right. And so it is, uh, it's a great, uh, great concept. We worked closely with our PIO department. Deborah Ostriker was the brainchild behind Phoenix is hot, and it has gotten us incredible mileage. Really excited about what you will give us next as your next direction and vision after your summer break and moving this forward and truly looking forward to continuing to um, address those metrics and bring them back to you. Thank you. Somebody think of putting the word hot before. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Noakowski. Mr. Mackey, thank you for all your hard work. You know, majority of these are actually in downtown in my district and also in Cape Cayuga's district, but my district stretches out to the west side and southwest Phoenix. How can we actually bring some of these programs, entrepreneurship, into other parts of our city? I mean, we have the old bull um, um, offices out on the I-17 and Thunderbird. I mean, we have facilities that we can actually use. I know the focus is right now around the universities and downtown, but I think that we have an opportunity to not just cluster everyone in the downtown area, don't get me wrong, I mean, I love it in my district, but how can we actually spread it out so it becomes a culture throughout the whole city? The other thing is, how do we start to become the data mecca for the whole country, where we can create the databases for all these big corporations that you were talking about earlier? If you think about it, if we can attract the data centers for all these big corporations and have it based out of Phoenix, and then eventually bring their headquarters over, I mean, I think that we have an opportunity there. So I think that these data centers can be spread out through all of our different districts that, that we have. And I think we have an opportunity to really create a culture throughout the whole city, not just within the downtown area and within our schools, um, like the vice mayor was talking about, starting with the education of our, our kids and getting involved with them, uh, Microsoft, um, directors and stuff, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, we need to have our young people involved so they become in that entrepreneurship. But the other thing too is um, Metro Center. I mean, there's a lot of space there. How can we create that excitement where it's a cool place to go and hang out and live and actually shop and, and be a part of that? Uh, even entrepreneurship's not just about technical. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at Desert Sky Mall was gonna be closing down and we actually created an old Mervins into a uh, a 200 um, store, um, Mercado, it's called Mercado de los Cielos. And those individuals created it, an incubator where they have a 10 by 10 booth, and now they're stretching out into the malls now, and they have their own businesses and they're starting to expand. One person actually has four different stores throughout the city of Phoenix by just creating the opportunity in a 10 by 10 space to feel like I always wanted to create my own business, but I never knew I had the opportunity to do it. I didn't have the cash to start off, but with that 10 by 10 booth inside a mall, gave them that opportunity. So how do we create that feel of entrepreneurship throughout the whole city? Chairman, Councilman Nowakowski, we are looking at the whole city. The only way we're going to get to 5,000 makers, startups, and tinkers in five years if we fully engage all 517 square miles of this city. Um, as we look at other areas of your district, as we look at areas around Grand Canyon University, we've been having conversations with Metro Center's owners. Interestingly enough, they've agreed to give us the space for free oh, uh, to great. bring in a, an incubator. We've had two or three groups through the space already who are, are seeing how that could potentially work for them. I absolutely agree with you. These are spaces that we're, we should be all over. Interestingly enough, the number one place we get demand for it is at High Street. Uh, would be in Desert Ridge. So our, our makers and our, our co-working spaces, the number one request we get is in the Desert Ridge area. Uh, we are working closely and on identifying either city-owned spaces that can be partnered with, where there are companies who would give small spaces for free where these incubators could get a start. Um, we're working closely with Hustle Phoenix in South Phoenix, which is more focusing on exactly what you're talking about. They're not necessarily the tech companies, but they're, they're people who want to start their own companies who are in areas where tremendous benefit could come from those companies starting. And Oye is doing an amazing job. Phil and I are working closely with him and doing an ama he's doing an amazing job and we want to help him. Uh, looking at exactly, you know, as you talked about with Microsoft being embedded in the, in the schools and the educational system, we're working on Teal 
with the vice mayor and, and through that office. Um, but really engaging and getting the kids interested in science early on, mm -hmm. getting them to be able to elevate, as we heard yesterday from what's going on at the, at the Biosciences High School in, in, uh, from ASU and getting uh, those moving up, you had a, you now go to a 95% graduation rate from an area where the graduation rate had been below 30%. Um, how do we bring this all together and create that strategic ecosystem where we rise up to the levels of a Seattle or a Portland or a Silicon Valley or Austin, which is what our focus and our strategic plan is working towards. So uh, we are looking closely at that and we'll be bringing uh, either new concepts back to you or continuing that conversation, but we expect to be able to bring back to you and be, certainly before the end of the year, ideas on spreading it out into the area without having to put burden on the city on the cost structure, but being able to work with the local entrepreneurship to identify those areas where we can bring these assets to bear all over the entire city in that North I-17 corridor is prime right. for those. And, and you are spot on on that tech workforce. The economic multiplier on those tech jobs is higher than any other focus. And then finally on the data centers, we are probably the number one location in the world for data centers, low cost of power, low natural disasters, lower cost of doing business. So have a, a strong focus, you wanna be cautious because they take up a lot of space without a lot of jobs. But as you bring those on, how do you partner with their corporate headquarters? How do you create that demand that's here? We saw what happened with eBay. Their data center is here in downtown Phoenix. They're expanding, but they then brought in a, a 2,000 person contingent in the region to complement that. So we have a strong, in our advanced business services sector in our strategy, a strong focus on that. But even working with our parks and, and creating a data center underneath our parks. I mean, you talk about data centers need to be at about 72 degree mm -hmm. temperature. Mm -hmm. So what better than Mother Earth to be that insulator? So I think we can think outside the box and come up with creative ways where people will say, wow, Phoenix is really on it now that they got these data centers underground, they got an airport on top of it, or you know, that whole, all that property around their airport, I mean, would be ideal for a, for a data center to be underground and, and having some type of activities for 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 our families to have parks and stuff like that great thank ideas you. uh excellent points thank you uh council nowakowski and um, vice mayor thank you for your leadership on uh, entrepreneurship uh really appreciate how you've taken the the mantle on this and really run with it and chris of course thank you for um uh you know, supercharging these efforts and already the accolades that you've received for it. Um, and uh, I do appreciate Phoenix is hot. You know, it's something that's gotten us a lot of earned media and uh, there's a real sensitivity to, to costs and budgets here. So thank you for that. Um, I was wondering about the, the hive. So we have the hive and that's been very successful at Burton Bar Library. Again, I would echo the comments that uh, Councilman Nowakowski uh, has made, you know, the, we'd love to see this expanding, you know, for example, into District 3 and, uh, you know, a, a hive at uh, Mesquite Library there with PV Mall and everything that's going on there, I think, would be would be a natural. So that would be something, you know, I'd, I'd certainly like to see is expanding that concept. And you talked about Metro Center, same thing, PV Mall. Unfortunately, we have vacant space in PV Mall as well. So I think that would be another opportunity. And it's really a crossroads there between not only Northeast Phoenix, but also Scottsdale and Paradise Valley to really bring people together uh, because not all the entrepreneurs are in downtown Phoenix. They're, they're throughout the valley. So would love to, to work with you on that. Um, any other comments or questions on this particular item? Thank you very much um, for the presentation. Oh, just, yes, absolutely. Because I just maybe this is a good opportunity just to give some shout outs. Uh, think of this for just a moment. We had the the Innovation Games, which is led by it's a city initiative. The mayor the mayor uh, announced it at the State of the City. Really exciting. Just last night, Seed Spot had their demo day, and this weekend, Cahoots is having Code Day, right? And so now you have the City of Phoenix officially with the program, and you have two of the more uh, successful uh, co-working spaces and incubators in the country. And they're right here in Phoenix, and and we're all communicating. Everyone's communicating, working together, making sure that these are uh, very successful for everyone. 
And, and I think that's a snapshot of the ecosystem that's being created right here in Phoenix, which is really exciting. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and this takes us to our last one, item number nine, which is the new monthly report on key Phoenix economic indicators. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, one of the things that the council has been asking for in the last couple of years is more transparency in our budgeting. And one of the aspects of that is the information that our budget and research department looks at in order to come up with revenue estimates. And so our budget and research director is here to talk to you about a new report we've put out, and we would seek any thoughts and input you have on that. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ed. Thank you, uh, Chairman, members of the subcommittee, for your time on the agenda this, uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about a new report that uh, the budget and research department is, has put together with assistance from the aviation department, from the planning and development department, public works, and water services. And what we're bringing, is, bringing forward is a, a compilation of data and measures that are um, uh, compiled, compiled by the city. And then put, we put this together in a, in a new report that really helps us with assessing our overall economic picture, our economic trends. Um, it's city data that is specific to, city, to the city of Phoenix, which makes this particularly helpful. We're able to get economic data from various sources. Uh, but typically, when it's coming from outside, it's coming, uh, it's, it pertains to the greater Phoenix area or the state of Arizona. And so what this data does is it helps us see what's going on specifically with the city of Phoenix for the most part. Uh, and I do have a few ex examples that I'd like to share with you of what's coming out of this report. I have a, high, a hard copy of the report here in my hands, and uh, it, it shows all these graphs and charts within that report. Um, but really, we're going to we want to provide this information electronically to the council, and we also plan to put this information on our website, phoenix.gov/budget, uh, is where people can go to find this additional information. Transparency is is not about just having the access, but it's also about finding a way to have useful information that's presented in a helpful way, and th and that's what we're, we believe this report does. So one example is our Sky Harbor Airport total passengers. And so uh, it's, it's great to see what's going on at Sky Harbor. And, and you've seen this measure before when we talk about what's happening at the airport. But uh, what this does is it per puts it in the context of what's going on in the economy. And how does this, how does this uh, give us some insight into the overall economic activity? Uh, the Sky Harbor Airport passenger count helps us know what's going on with regional tourism, and with business activity, and overall, uh, is the economy doing well? And that's that's going to be reflected in our passenger count at Sky Harbor. I think Councilman Warren had, had a question, question on this one. This. So, sure. so this is the 29 million is not for the year; it's for these three months. Actually, it's year to date. So fiscal um, on this one. I mean, uh, what it shows is it starts in December. I, I guess I just assumed it was December through. So yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the way we uh, put these graphs together was a three-month window of the year-to-date numbers. And the reason we did that is because when we show the full year, it's hard to see those lines and the differentiation between the lines. So we really zoomed in on those lines so that you could see the comparisons from the current year-to-date, which is that top blue line. Uh, and then uh, the, the prior year is the red line. And then the three-year average is the green line. So uh, if, we, if we showed the full year, it would be a lot harder to see on the graph the differentiation, which is why we zoomed in on those three months. But it's really the year to date. So the line numbers. is just the three months. The, the line. 29 million is for the year to date right. starting January 1st. Right. And you can see on the February line, it goes up to the close to 29 million for the year to date number. So I guess my question was, how susceptible is this? I mean, 29 million is a lot, so uh, I, I guess we had the Super Bowl in here. So how skewed is the number? Because obviously we had a lot more people who just we don't have a Super Bowl next That's year, right. so aren't going to come back. So That's how? Right. So absolutely. So so this particular year, it wouldn't be an issue in other years, maybe. I mean, we always have big events, but just not usually like that. So um, so you're going to see so for for activity that happens from the Super Bowl or other events. You're, you're going to see that in the current year, in the current year numbers. That's that's built into there for, for the month of February. I mean, how much does it really move it? I mean, because it's really one weekend, more or less. But those are the busiest days Scar Harbor's ever had, right? That's right. So so you, 
how much does it move the needle? I, I'm not sure I have the I answer to that to, question. You know, obviously, but... it's great to say it's better than last year, but yes. we won't have the Super Bowl next year. So is it really, for this particular measure, is it really a helpful measure indicative of things are getting better? So the, One weekend, it got better, that's for sure. But The, the purpose, uh, Councilman, of the report is really to pull all of these measures together and to give some insight over as to what's going on overall and so that you can see not, not to look at these on a specific individual basis, but to look at these as a, as a whole. And this helps give an idea of what's going on with the economy. May give us some insight as to, to what might be coming uh, in the economy, but, uh, or, or kind of, you know, we can explain some of what's going on in the current year because, uh, because of the Super Bowl. But you can see even prior to the Super Bowl in the current year in December, in the December year to date number, we were well above the prior year to date. So even before the effect of the Super Bowl kicked in, uh, the city's been doing well on the on this year. I'm not criticizing the measures or anything. It's just, I don't know how the other guys do it. I, I look at it, if you got 10 measures, I might put mental smiley faces next to seven of them that are going up or going up significantly. Um, but for something like this, I guess I might just mentally hold it out just because of what we're talking about with the Super Bowl. But all right, I, I get it. I have no reason to belabor it. I was just curious how, how volatile it is with one big weekend like we had. Right. So another one is our... Yes, is our no, Kowski, oh, I'm so sorry. So going back to that, I mean, it's just basically a straight line. You don't have like valleys and hills, ups and downs, because even with our spring training, I would imagine that we would have some ups and then downs when it comes to passengers at the airport, right? Uh, Chairman Gates, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, yes, that's a great point. The reason that's the case is because what we're showing is the year-to-date numbers, and that's okay. all throughout the year that's going to continue to rise. Um, and the, the, the point here with the graph is really to show not what's going on on an, on an individual month, right. up or down, but rather from year to year and in comparison with the, with the last three years. So that's really what the purpose here is, and which, which is why we wanted to go with year-to-date. So same thing with our water service accounts. On the water service accounts, we get a different perspective on, on what might be happening with the economy. Uh, can tell us a little bit what, what's going on with population or commercial uh, or residential property development. So just another indicator here, which when we look at it together with the other uh, measures is, is helpful. <clears throat> Uh, new home construction permits issued. Again, I ask you, I'm sorry. Yes, Councilor I, I promise not to do this on each measure. But, uh, <laughs> of course, you, you guys are laughing because you think I might be lying, because I might do this might very well, but I'm going to try not to. Uh, I know everybody wants to get going to different stuff, including me. Um, so the water, I guess I'm curious, how did this compare? Maybe you didn't look, but so I'd be curious. When things were really great in 2005 or 2006, and I'm sure this was probably shooting up because people were moving here. Are, are, there, is, are we, what we seeing, I see a trend up, but is it in any way comparable to how things were when things were really rolling and people were maybe moving here? There was an article in the Tucson paper that I happened to see about population that said Maricopa County, not Phoenix specific, but I think it was Maricopa County, is really, all of a sudden we're getting that same kind of feel again. And I'm just curious if that's true based on this particular measure. And can I actually kind of piggyback on that question? Because no, I, I think it's... I think it's... I just want to see oh, yeah, your, yeah, exactly. see look on your face if I said no. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. But, but I think you've really hit on something, which is three years is interesting, but maybe what's more relevant is 2008 numbers on this. Or maybe we could add an additional, because that was really our high point. So, you know, just a thought because I think that's kind of what you're, what you're, yeah, 2007, 2008. It's almost well. like you're in my head. It's exactly. just it's scary. It's just so find a peak a long here. Time. So maybe so at the peak. airport, there was another year that was peak, but we, we can go back and see if we can identify maybe a peak point for each one of these indicators as a it helps sort of a, a frame, benchmark. Yeah. A, and a, frame a frame of reference. Yeah. I would yeah. say a frame of reference. What, we know what it looks like when it's really bad. We know what it looks like it's really good. Where does this fit yeah. in? So that's, Sorry that, to make, I don't want to make no, no, no. work for you, that's but helpful. I, it would be helpful to That's why I want to do this. Part of this is economics now. So what it, this is interesting because it says we're above, we're significantly above a three-year average. That's a good sign. Yeah. Right. But if the added information you're seeking is, and how are we doing based on our previous high water mark? Right. That's yeah, something compared we can to go a back flaw and do. period. Yeah. Then that's not that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know. That's good feedback. Thank you for backing me up there, Bill. You got it. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
So new home construction permits is another look, another uh, uh, <clears throat> bit of perspective can tell us about what's going on, again, with population, but also housing market strength. Um, we also could, you know, it may be affected by shifts in the preferences for, for housing, the, the types of housing that people want to see. Millennials, we know, uh, may not be uh, ready to purchase homes, and so we might be seeing some effect of that. But in the current year, we do see we are above the prior year and, ab and above the three-year average by a significant amount. But another look gives us uh, the multifamily units that are that are uh, have been permitted similar to the homes but again may reflect some shifts in preferences uh, this is actually where we're seeing um, some some uh, decline compared to the prior year we believe that that's uh, affected by a, a one-time boost last year at the same time uh, which which was a little bit higher so it would, so sometimes sometimes we see that in these uh, comparisons as well where one year may be particularly high or temporarily or even artificially high due to some reason, and then the, the, the next year it kind of uh, mellows and normals back out. And then the third in the area of planning and development is the total value of permitted activity. Again, in the indicative of uh, property market, market values and development activity and the overall property and development market strength. Another look um, that we can bring is the solid waste. Can I just? Yes, Councilman. I'm combining Moran. the last two, so yeah. I'm sticking to my pledge. <laughs> there you go. Asking about everyone. <laughs> but but I did go to an economic forum relatively recently with bankers who were talking about one of the, one of the indicators that they had found that was shocking was apparently every year, and I think it was a million and a half, for for years and years, every year we were creating a million and a half new households. You graduate from college, you move out of your parents' house. That's a household. Two people get married. That we're living apart now you've subtracted so but the net gain was always a million and a half and it just plummeted they showed us the chart in like 2007 2008 all of a sudden that just stopped completely which had a lot of ripple effects they're like this is one thing it's starting to trend upward again which i think kind of uh, fits with the last maybe really three mm -hmm. uh permitted activity yes. the home construction and so forth they seem to think this was an incredibly important indicator that had heretofore been unknown to me and it sounds like fairly overlooked I'm just curious, um, again, back to Bill's point, I, it's kind of belaboring it, but just to make sure that we see what kind of the high water mark was, and maybe for this one, a longer term. It just sounds like it was really consistent for a long time, probably more so on an upward trajectory here because we we're just adding more people. But, but where does this rank in, in that, in sort of the lot bigger picture? So sorry to make more work. No, that's good. We'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, as Ed said, we'll take a look at what the peak years were and, and bring that comparison into these charts. That might be one where we would have a hard time finding household creation for our city limits. I understand. But we might see what else is out there. And, and that's true. I, I wasn't necessarily saying compared to what they came up with yeah. because that was national. It's just, it's just more. It's an indicator of what's going to drive the future creation of housing units. Mm -hmm. And we I think Elliot Pollock, we've now, been to lots so. of things with Elliot where he's really focused on that. Maybe because he had two or three kids move home or something, I don't know. But but that that's the that's what the effect has been as right. consolidation of households well, rather than expansion. House, right. right. So another look here is so, solid waste, the total tonnage collected. Uh, again, uh, maybe an indicator of what's going on with population, commercial and residential development environmental shifts, or even consumer behavior with, with the way uh, people handle their, their waste. And on that one, I'm kind of looking around for John Trujillo, but I'd be interested to, to get solid waste perspective on that, because that's significant. That, that's and, uh, huge. Yeah. Uh, I guess also, so solid waste, is that, does that include recycle? It does. It does include recycling. The recycle is factored in here, because oh. otherwise oh. it seems uh -oh. like... There we go. So recycling is the next slide I'm showing here, oh, the next slide. which okay. it breaks that part. That breaks that component out. And you see the numbers set. even higher. That's a great question. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, we'd be hoping to see waste, you know, recycle isn't hopefully waste. Some... Right. So you see when you look at the recycling percentage growth, it's even higher than the total tonnage as a whole. As long as that's included in the last one, that's good. So. Um, actually, if we can just take, I think Ginger Spencer wanted to comment uh, from the solid waste perspective, which would be great. I'm sorry, I didn't see you over there. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Um, so we have seen some changes. We were averaging about a million tons of trash each year. 
Um, as you can see, if we go back to the um, total tonnage, so I'm trying to make sure I'm looking at these numbers correctly. Um, so that is a little bit um, down from what we normally see. However, if you go to the recycling one, um, you could see that those efforts are up. So as we, so part of what's going on is if we are, if there are more people moving to Phoenix, right, and we're getting more accounts, um, then the tonnage, the, the waste will go up. But also at the same time too, we're trying to get people to recycle more. Um, so at some point, you will probably see it go down slightly um, with the increase in the recycling. Does that make sense? So there's probably going to be a trade-off at some point. And it just, at some point, I understand why this is included, but it might also be a little misleading. Yeah. Because if we're backing out in any way the recycling, we're, hope, we're trying to get people to recycle more. Right. And we don't really want more waste. So we're kind of, we're kind of mixing things up. I'm not sure this, this is as helpful as some of the other measures. For yeah. that reason, and, but and I understand what you're saying yeah. because of the consumer behavior or the behavior all changing aspect that of this. Yeah. But it, again, it's intended to just give one one bit more perspective and insight into the overall, and so that's that's why we included this here. And, it, and I think we do need to make sure that there's that caveat out there that behavioral changes can affect that number. And again, one of the points is really what's happening here, and this is when you see these charts and you say, "Why did that happen?" and you start drilling into it. That's where you really illuminate what's going on. So, yes. so this we hope is the first step to people saying, "Huh, that's interesting. What more should we learn? Be drilling into and learning about that." So, yes. and, so and the only other thing I would add with the total tonnage as well, it's residential plus any waste that's being brought directly to our transfer stations. So that could be from haulers, it could be from private companies, that sort of thing. So anything that's coming through the transfer station, that's what's collected in the total tonnage there. Thank you. Just a couple of more here that I want to show you. So city sales tax, you're, you're actually used to seeing this one at the council meetings. Um, and but, but again, it's, it, does, it is an important indicator of what's going on with uh, spending within the Phoenix economy, particularly retail, which we show you here as well, which is doing better than the city sales tax uh, overall. Uh, so you see 5% growth a year to date with just the retail category of city sales tax, which really reflects, reflects the consumer spending levels within the city of Phoenix. Another one that we brought in, which this is, this is actually a state measure, um, but we think it's important to, to look at is the state vehicle license tax. Um, so you can, we can see specifically a little bit more about what's going on, even though this one is statewide, uh, more what's going on with vehicle sales, uh, which, which is a part of our retail sales. And you did, uh you skipped one, the restaurants and bar, Mr. Chair, if I can. Yes. Uh, the restaurants and bars one. I mean, all of this is usually the basics. That one is a little more discretionary spending. Um, the hotels obviously have big events and so forth. But, but the restaurants and bars, seeing that go up, maybe puts a smile on my face more than almost anything else because it means people have money in their pocket that they feel like they can go out for dinner instead of not. Yes. So um, that was one you skipped that I just would want to point out to people, I think, is an important. Yes, and it you. looks like it's good. Uh, yeah, I don't think you showed it up there. but. And just so you know, know, I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting. Just so you know, we're all happy when he has a smile on his face. So that's good <laughs> it's for almost all never happened. So yeah. It's yeah. Just, uh, rare, rare occurrence. <laughs> but, uh, put a smile but I think you face. take my point. I just, for mm -hmm. specific reason, I think that's a good one. To yeah, that's, that is, that is, that's a great point. I, I didn't show it on these slides today, but it is in the report. And I'm very unhappy others. you didn't show it. So imagine how disappointed <laughs> my colleagues are. Just kidding. Uh, uh, Phoenix assessed valuation. Uh, this, this gets into a deeper look at our property, what's going on with our, our property and our housing market, uh, our commercial market. Um, and so this, this provides also the basis of our property tax levy in the city of Phoenix. Um, Phoenix median household income indicates both job and wage activity levels, indicates the type of jobs that are uh, uh, happening within our Phoenix economy. Um, and so we, we get a deeper look at that as well in this report. The Phoenix unemployment rate, uh, which um, this is one where negative is good because uh, we, we want to see that unemployment rate keep coming down. And then we also show um, the Phoenix labor force participation rate, which is another look at the employment in, as an employment indicator, uh, which accounts for the discouraged worker effect. So we can see um, what type of utilization of the, of the labor force in total we're seeing 
even with people that have stopped actively looking for, for work. So um, th that concludes the presentation today. There's no action that we're requesting from you. We do appreciate the feedback that you've given us to be able to uh, make this report even better. Um, but this is really just about presenting you um, this new report and, and letting people know that this is going to be available on our web page. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions you might have. That also, I'm sorry, I meant to introduce uh, Rick Fries, our Deputy Budget and Research Director, um, and Laura Brown, who's in, in the audience. They um, did a great job of pulling this information together and, and setting it all up. So just want to want to thank them for their hard work on that. Thank you. No, thanks for your work on this. I thought great comments and questions from my colleagues. Just the one request that I would have, unless anyone else has uh, comments or questions, is that not only are the reports on the website, but in a more prominent site, so, you know, position in the website so people don't have to dig around to, to find it um, because it's a, this is great, great information. I think will be helpful for us as policymakers, but also helpful for business people, quite frankly. That they can know they can go there and access this information and potential, uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses and other people that might be looking at moving to the city of Phoenix. So with that, unless there are any comments or questions, thank you for your work on this. Thank you yeah, for your real report. Good. Real happy um, to have this. Yes. I I, uh, yeah, absolutely. So now we're going to the, um, well, first of all, call to the public. I don't, I don't have any cards. Do we have anyone who wishes to address the, the subcommittee? One person. We have one person. Okay. Yeah, we do have a, if we can have uh, you fill out a card here. We do have two minutes for call to the public. So go ahead. We can. Yeah, first of all, uh, is it on? Yes. Okay, it is good. on. If we legalize marijuana, maybe we'd get some meaningful tax revenue. The CIA's been making all that money. And, and as long as it doesn't to kids, it's for adults only. So, uh, I, you know, that reminds me, um, with last week I got an article. Uh, the editor of The Lancet recently made a comment in one of the most recent Lancet, which is one of the most distinguished medical journals in the world. And he said that many of these medical studies are, uh, might be uh, wrong. So that's the edit that was the editor. Uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how many of these jobs, the uh, job increase uh, dealt with uh, pertain to illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants? I want to know how many American citizens were, were uh, unemployed. You, didn't make that, you can't make that determination, can you? Because I'd like to... Um, crack down on illegal immigration and give uh, attrition through enforcement. But I'm in the minority. So um, thank you. Richard Paul Zuckerman. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And we can, yeah, we can have you uh, work with Sam over there and get a uh, card filled out. Uh, don't see any other folks uh, for call to the public, so that takes us to future agenda items. The members of the subcommittee have just been handed a list, a pretty lengthy list here of future agenda items. Oh, and that's not true. I haven't passed it on uh, to my colleagues here. Uh, that's some poor chairing right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I stand corrected. Can I ask a, can I ask a question about that? Yes, you uh, may. So the City Hall coffee, that's the thing we had the briefing on before. Yes. Are we going to get further briefings. I know it's a month away, but but before we have this subcommittee. Yes. About kind of where that's at. Yes, for our so viewers, this yes. relates to the uh, Starbucks that's located in our lobby. Yeah, this is more specific to the lobby concession. Oh, it's just concession. the lobby. It's not yeah. the rest of it's the... It's not the okay. entire thing, no. Well, this is why I'm asking, so now I know. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. But I still, I guess, I like to know. And the time's up. The, You're done. Okay. You're done, Councilman. All right. right. Um, so you wish you could just that kidding. All the time. I know. I, I can read your thoughts. <laughs> Not at all. Feel your look. We, uh, we have, uh, uh, like I said, we have several uh, future agenda items here. Additional items uh, that folks would like to add to future agendas. Are we are we going to have the same briefing? How often are we going to have these briefings? Is that a monthly thing or? It, it's uh, really up to the chair. We. The briefing on the economic indicators yeah. today was in order for you to be aware that we're going to now convert that into a web-based uh, monthly report. And so it will be available monthly and updated monthly uh, and, and maybe, on Phoenix.gov. Maybe every month would be too much of a good thing, but could we have, if they're going to be doing it anyway, we can do it quarterly. Could they put it 
Well, I mean, can we put the results every month into our packet so we well, can sure. look at it at our leisure? Yes. And if we have questions, maybe that's yeah. The way I to, think that would be, no. I, I think I think that would I something. think that would be great. And yeah. then to the extent that yeah, okay. any of the members have questions, we can raise those. But if not, it'll just be background material for the the members of the subcommittee. And are, are we doing it just for the subcommittee, or are we? I know it's on the web page, but obviously there's hundreds of pages on the web page. So. Are we doing it to, for the full council? We will, um, so this one, now that it's gone through the subcommittee, we'll put it into the full council packet uh -huh. so that everyone is aware uh, of that. Perfect. Any other uh, additional items? All right, if not, then with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.